We're in a study on Wednesday nights for the last three years on predestination and love. Predestination is, I was thinking about this today, and I really need to help everybody understand this. God chooses his family from the foundation of the world. It's just like a couple that decides to have children. The word father in Hebrew is the word, comes from the article from the word ab, it's pronounced av, avraham, and it means to with, to desire, 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 or decide. And of course, the word judge, judge, is a word that means to decide guilt or innocent or innocent. Now that's the word decide. And that is, the word judge is krino, K-R-I-N-O, and that means to decide who's guilty or who's innocent. Of course, who is innocent is in the family of God because to be in his family, you have to walk righteously. And predestinate, I'll say a couple of things about predestination. Predestinate belongs to the believer only. Don't tell somebody that God predestinates somebody to hell. And you run across somebody when you tell them that God's ordained men to destruction, they'll say, you believe in double predestination. No. The word predestinate is the word pro orizo. Pro orizo. And of course, it comes from pro meaning before and horizo, which is our word, H-O-R-I-Z-O-N. And the horizon is the division of light and darkness. Uh, or the horizon is is the light that goes to the darkness. And that's where you, the dividing point is. Of course, the word prison means the division of light and darkness. And the word forgiveness, that's prison, is P-H-U-L-A-K-E. That means division. Notice how all this works together. Division of light and darkness. And darkness. And the word forgiveness. Forgiveness is the word A-P-H-E-S-I-S, -S, and that is the same word as remission. And Jesus said that we have to drink the cup for remission of sin, and that don't mean to drink grape juice. Drinking a cup meant to undergo a death, and that has the same meaning as faith. If you notice, every time you have one meaning, it has the meaning as something else. Faith is the substance. Substance, hypostasis, means to stay under or through the stasis, or under or through standing upright, or the cross, and that's a continual dying. Well, that's what drinking the cup is. And it's two different phrases for saying the same thing. So remission and forgiveness, they're two different words for saying the same thing. <coughs> and the word forgiveness means to pardon and release from prison or from darkness into the light. So he's pre-lightened us, and he's predetermined that we will walk in the light. So when you think of predestinate, think of walking in the light. In the light. And predestinate is what he determines that we will do. And he calls his kingdom, Colossians 1, 10 through 12, God says that his kingdom is the kingdom, kingdom of light. And, and of course, the word kingdom, be a S-I-L-E-U-S -E comes from the word reign, reign, or it comes from the word kingdom or queen or anything that has to do with an emperor or an authority in a kingdom. And, it, and we also get the word B-A-S-I-S. -S. And the base of something is the foundation of something. The base of our bodies is our feet. And that is actually what the word basis means in Scripture. It means foot or the walk. So what God has done, he's predestinated us to walk in the light, and light is always equated with truth. When you get to looking at scripture, always think, think synonyms. Uh, dying to self, daily cross, daily dying, self-denial, faith, drinking the cup, they all mean the same thing. They're all having to do with giving up the flesh. And then when you give up the flesh, you start walking in the light, are you walking the truth? And when the scripture says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. 
Well, of course, the word pro predestinate, prohorizo, means to pre-bound inside the light. And he don't just put us there. He, he predetermines that we're going to walk right. And when we, when we say that, people, I've had people say, then you believe in works for salvation. That's like saying a kingdom was called a, or a family was called a kingdom. That's like saying, well, uh, I've got a son, and he had to be, he has to uh, uh, do what I say in order to stay in my family. No, that's not what it is. He has to do what I say because he is in my family. That's the point. This is not works for salvation. This is salvation that works. The same reason when you have children, uh, you don't let them do what they want to do, do you? And th is that like, that's like saying, well, my father took his belt off and spanked me, and if I don't obey him, he's going to cause me to be unborn, and I'll no longer be his son. That is ridiculous. God chooses who he wants to be his, and he did that before the foundation of the world, and not only that, he chose who he was going to birth. And when he chose who he was going to birth, then he births them into his kingdom. Uh, Robert Fulton called me uh, today, and uh, I, I told him before, uh, over there in, in John 1 and 13, I always tell everybody, John 1 13 is one verse I don't know what free will people do with. Well, he had a guy do something with it the other day. <laughs> John, 1, John 1 11, John 1 11 says, he came into his own. His own received him not, but as many as received him. Now that word received means it's the word elabon, E-L-E-L-A-B-O-N. And it comes from the word L-A-M-B-A-N-O. And of course you add prefixes and you change word endings when you have a change in the tense. Well, this word received in John 1.12 this word received in John 1.12 is that word elabon. It comes from lambano. It means to take hold of. Now, <coughs> now this is what's funny. I've got to tell you all this. It means to take hold of. And, of course, uh, Isaiah 64 and 7 says that there's none that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. In other words, there's none that wakes himself from the dead to take hold of God. Well, we can't take hold of God, so he has to cause us to take hold of him. And the tense of that verb there is first aorist active indicative. And being a first aorist active indicative means it's a constant, continual taking hold. Well, the, it goes on to say, as many as received him, to them gave he the power. Of course, the word power is exousia. E-X-O-U-S-I-A. E-X-O-U-S-I-A. And it comes from the E-X-E-S-T-I, and that's our word existence. It means being. He gives us the existence and it comes from E-I-M-I, -I, and that means to be. He gives us the existence to become, and the word become is G-I-N-O-M-A-I, -I, and that is the word, we get the word genesis or gene, and of course the word genesis comes from the word birth or birthday. He gives us the existence to, and he gives us the existence to become or to come into being. Now, he does that. We don't do that to ourselves. To become the sons of God, even to them that believe it on his name. And he's telling me how he, he was showing this guy this. And then the next verse is the one verse I don't understand what people can't do with. And speaking about this verse, he's given us the power, the exousia, or the existence, or the being to become the sons of God. Well, that's talking about our new birth, isn't it? Sure it is. Then the next verse says, which were born... Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And when he told him about verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, he said, well, that's talking about God's birth. <laughs> I said, what? God was born? I guess. I don't know. It's talking about God's birth. Probably talking about Jesus being born. No, the context of those verses there is about our birth, and it would be kind of redundant to say God was born not of the will of man, <laughs> or God was born not of 
the will of the flesh. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking our birth, our new birth, was not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but it was God's will. That's why James 1.18 says, of his own will beget. That means to conceive and birth. Beget he us. Beget is the whole process. Well, that's what it means. He's begotten us by the word of truth. And I just thought that was funny. I said, I never ever had anybody do anything with this verse, verse 13, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And if there's one verse you want to give to somebody, give them that verse and say, hey, do you believe you're saved by your own will? What about it's not of your will? And you can read that to somebody and they'll go, well, I don't think that means that. Well, certainly it does. We're reading from the forgotten Spurgeon every Wednesday night. People don't know Charles Spurgeon. They think they do because every, on every page of, of everything that he wrote, he wrote about predestination. <clears throat> and I'm going to start reading where I left off last week, and I'm going to read you a little bit because most people won't go out and buy a Spurgeon book, won't buy a Puritan book. I've got the new books, The Doctrines of Repentance by Thomas Watson, and I'm going to pick those up tomorrow. So everybody that wants one, uh, they're 3 or $4 a piece, something like that. Those are, that is some hard-hitting material. I, I read from that on some of the messages. Let me read here from Mr. Spurgeon. While the new life imparted in regeneration is never the ground of our justification, nevertheless, the Scripture knows nothing of the possibility of a justified man who has not experienced the washing of regeneration, Titus 3 and 5. I'm going to talk about that again some more tonight. Armenianism, and when we say Armenianism, Joseph Arminius propagated the doctrine of free will. When we say free will, we don't mean a free will Baptist down here. All Baptists are free will as far as I'm concerned. If they don't believe in the doctrines of predestination, that God has a family, that he's chosen before the foundation of the world, that they should be holy and without blame, and he births who he wills, then he gets his scourge out or his belt or razor strap, and he makes us behave ourselves. And that's what this is about. Arminianism has frequently separated conversion and sanctification because it has lost the truth that regeneration is the cause of conversion. But once the biblical doctrine of regeneration is grasped, it means that no man can be a true believer who does not possess a new life created in righteousness and true holiness. And a lot of people say, well, I'm saved and I can live the way I want to and I don't have to really seek any godly or holy living. I heard in an independent Baptist home as I was growing up, I listened to preachers preach and they'd say, we don't know what holiness is. We don't know what holy means. Only God's holy and we can never, never ever attain to that. So therefore, uh, we don't even need to try. Well, you better find out because there is an imperative command in 1 Peter, the first chapter, that says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And he said, He has sanctified us. Uh, he has sanctified us by His Word, and the word holy and sanctify come from the same word. The word holy is H A G I O S, and the word sanctify is H A G I A Z O, and the word holiness is H A G I O I A S. M-O-S, hagiosmos, and when you're holy, that means to be one or pure, and to make something pure takes fire, or fiery baptism, and if we don't go through that, we don't belong to God, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. That's not strange. That's a daily requirement that causes us to walk in truth or in the light where he's pre predetermined for us to be. Then he goes on to say, Armenianism has frequently separated conversion and sanctification because it has lost the truth that regeneration is the cause of conversion. But once the biblical doctrine of regeneration is grasped, it means that no man can be a true believer who does not possess life created in righteousness and true holiness. According to Scripture, it is quite impossible to be justified by faith and not to experience the commencement of true Sanctification. Now, sanctification, if I ask, uh, if I ask somebody what that meant, uh, what would y'all say? Would you have any idea what that meant? Most of y'all that's been here would know that. But if you were a, <coughs> if you were a uh, <coughs> Nazarene or some other people, some of the holiness people, they believe that holiness means to live above sin or without sin in your life. 
Of course, 1 John tells us if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and we make God a liar as well. Well, but yet the third chapter of 1 John says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. What is it that can't sin? The inner man. The outer man will sin from now on. But we will sin less and less as he puts us through more and more and more fire. I'm, I'm in a lot less sin than I was 25 years ago. And if you're not, unless you're not 25, uh, if you're not in less sin than you were 10 years ago or 5 years ago, you're going nowhere. And you can't be in the kingdom of God if, you get in the, if God births you and you don't change. There has to be a constant, continual, gradual taking hold of God or a, or a constant change. According to Scripture, it is quite impossible to be justified by faith and not to experience the commitment, commencement of true sanctification because the spiritual life communicated by the Spirit in the act of regeneration which introduces the new power to believe is morally akin to the character of God and contains within it the germ of all holiness. Thus, saving faith is never found in isolation. If you know what he's talking about, don't you? I got saved one night. It's not isolated. I got saved one night, and uh, if you'll let him be Lord. Well, Lord is the word kurios. It means to rule. If you're in his family, you can believe that he's the ruler. It's like saying you can be in a man's family and the father's not the ruler. If he's the right kind of father he ought to be, he will be the ruler and he'll use a ruler when he has to. As the Westminster Confession teaches, faith is the alone instrument of justification. But remember, you know, it's so hard to keep reminding yourself of these things as we go along. Faith cometh by hearing. Hear and obey with the same word in the, in the Hebrew, and they meant the same thing in the Greek. In the Greek, it's the word akuo, and it means to understand. And anything you understand, that's a change of mind, because the word mind means to understand, the word heart means to understand, and the word repent, metanoia, means to be turned and exercise the mind and understand. <coughs> Yet it is not alone in the person justified, but is ever accompanied with all saving graces. And that's true, because God will be gracious to us in daily life when he whips us and causes us to walk right and say, in my family, you don't get to live the way you want to. I don't know where in the world anybody ever come up with the idea to say that God spanks you and makes you behave, that that's legalism. Would you call that legalism in a family? Well, you're just being legal, Dad. You're making me behave, and that's what makes me be your son. No, you're the son, and you have to behave because the Father sets down the rules, and he decides what's right and wrong, not us. Because they teach this, the doctrines of grace are a barrier against carelessness and superficiality. That doctrine, that hellish doctrine of free will says, I walked the aisle one night, and I don't have to be saved by works, and therefore, I can do what I want to. And you know what that is? That's fatalism. They accuse us of fatalism. They're the fatalist. I don't have to behave myself. I can do as I please, and I get to go to heaven anyway. And that's what they accuse us of. You say you're going to heaven no matter what you do. No, no, free willer, you say that. You say, I walked the I got saved one night, that's it, it's all over with. No, it's not. That's the beginning of sanctification. <sighs> the very system which has been accused of lessening man's responsibilities has, wherever it has prevailed, produced generations of serious, God-fearing, and saintly people. That's just what I got through saying. God will produce in you and me as his children righteousness. We're going to behave. It don't matter whether we like it or not. And you know what? He'll teach us to like it. For Calvinism has always emphasized that it is by obedience and holiness that we fulfill the apostolic command to make our calling and election sure. And that word don't mean to be positive. That's the word be by us. That word sure, it means to stabilize the basis. The walk. Stabilize. And what stabilizes our walk? Adding to our faith seven things. And when you find seven, you find the number of baptism, which is the fertilization of the egg. 
Remember that? Refinement. Yeah. Huh? Refinement. Yeah, it's the fertilization, yes. If the divine calling has produced in us the fruit of obedience. I, for the life of me, I was raised in independent Baptist churches, and they would never read a verse that said, obey obedience. And Fred, oh gosh, we can't read those verses. Sound like legalism. God, God must have made a mistake when he put those in there. <laughs> I think that's what they believe. Then we may assuredly believe that we were separated unto God ere time began, and that this separation was according to the eternal purpose and will of God. You know what I look at when I see sanctification? I look at God does not live in time. He lives in eternity. And it's like, you know, you and I think, we think, well, God can arrange my life to go down here and meet somebody down here at Kmart, but he can't. Or, and we think of, oh, 10 minutes as, uh, oh, that's easy for God to arrange 10 minutes, but he can't arrange, he can't arrange 80 years. Well, see, 80 years is a few seconds to God. Uh, Glenn was, uh, Glenn and somebody got together one day and they figured out if man's a lot, a lot of time on the earth is 70 years, it adds up. If a day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day, it adds up to about 70 years is somewhere in the neighborhood of, a, of is it one hour and 40 something minutes. So that's all our life is in the sight of God. When God sanctifies, if this were time, if this were time, God is not bound in time. He's living up here. And he will consider this just a few moments. And he sanctifies and he arranges everything in your life. And he says, okay, I want you to do this. <laughs> now, we think that he can arrange going down here and turning left on Maple and turning right on Indian Lake Road and going down there and turning left on Gallatin Road and then going down there to Rivergate and turning right into Rivergate and walking there and running into somebody and say, oh, this is the will of God. He can arrange all those turns over a 10-minute period, but he can't do it over a 6,000-year period. Well, 6,000 years is 10 minutes to God. Now, why, and why is it the free will people believe he can arrange 15 minutes, but he can't arrange 1,000 years? Because God says, I, he said he chastised Israel, but for a moment, and it was 2,600 years. That's funny, isn't it? What difference? Yeah, what is a vapor? Whew, it's gone. I was sitting talking to Brooks last night, and I said, I can't believe I, I'm 57. I, I was 18 the other day. I <laughs> uh, had an old 49 Chevrolet, and I drove to high school. Gosh, what happened? Life is a vapor. It's that quick. I still feel like that same. We're all always basically the same. God just teaches us to behave ourselves. I'm still a little Jimmy Brown, Charlie Brown, all those nicknames they call me. I'm still that same guy. I'm just an older, I'm an older little boy. That's all I am. And, and it's same, all yours. In the same breath, though, Fred, but he, he gives us the opportunity to choose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, me. Look here. Now, on the other hand, Armenianism, which claims to be the protector of the doctrine of human responsibility. They claim to be the protector of, you gotta be responsible. No, we believe that, you don't. You think you can behave if you want to. We say we've been predestined to conform, we've been chosen to be holy, and he said he scourges us that we might be partakers of that holiness. The scourge is a bloody beating, and that's not by choice. He knows how to change our will. Now, he goes on to say, and has within his teaching an inevitable tendency to lower the biblical standard of true Christian experience. That's what they do. They lower the standard. They put man in charge, and God says, oh, I wish I could get you to do right. I just can't. You're stronger than me. In this connection, it is significant that modern evangelicalism has popularized the phrase, the eternal security of the believer. Well, I'm not even going to talk about that because he's preordained everything. What are you talking about eternal security? That's a very, that's a very mundane way of, of saying something because everything in our lives, he's arranging. Everything works together for good to the called. Whereas historic Calvinism maintained the final perseverance of the saints. We will persevere because God will see to it. We believe in the perseverance of the saints, but many are not saints and therefore do not persevere. Don't think everybody calls themselves a believer. And let me say this too. 
when somebody says, I believe in predestination, be sure and check them out. Ask them what it means. Some of them, most of them will say, well, I, they have to believe in predestination because Romans 8 and 29 says, for whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And Ephesians 1 and 11 says, we've obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counts of his own will. They will say, well, we believe in predestination. God predestinated everybody in the world to get saved. And you just need to let him. That's not predestination. That's free will in disguise. That's all it is. Don't, don't tell me you believe in predestination if you don't believe what it means. Now, it is true that Arminianism has been productive of many holiness meetings and conventions, but this fact, instead of rebutting the charge made above, rather confirms it because there was no need of a special teaching on sanctification until Arminianism began to prevail in evangelism. They didn't see any need for it. Calvinism held... And when we say Calvinism, I very seldom ever use that term because I don't believe even a lot of the Calvinist teachers understand men's total depravity and God's complete total work in our lives of everything that's going on. There's one thing that a lot of the Calvinists won't say that I will say. That is that God, before the foundation of the world, ordained certain men for destruction with no hope. And it amazes me that's what Romans 9, 22 says, What if God willing to show his wrath and make his power known, he endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And the Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Proverbs 16 and 4. God made them for himself, for his glory and for his pleasure. Are they made? Calvinism held that the same message which saved men makes them holy. Holiness is not something that comes one day. It holy is merely, you got to picture a piece of gold ore. Dig it out of the ground, put it, in a, put it in a furnace and burn out the impurities. That's what this is about. That's what predestination is about. It's about God preordains us for the fiery trial and there's none good, none understands, none seeks after God. And every man at his best state is altogether vanity. And all men, Job said in Job the 15th chapter, he said, all men drink iniquity like water. So how in the world is he going to get that out of us? He births us according to his will. And then he turns up the heat and he says, here is the journey. And you're going to walk it my way. And you say, no, my way. And he says, well, we'll see about that. And who gets their way? God. And what he does, I like it, I like what I say, like I would have said before. It's like we're a, we're a tough cowboy when it comes to the kingdom of God. We come up bow legs and we say, let me put me on that bronc. And that bronc is God, or, it, or we're the bucking horse usually, and God comes in and he straddles us, and he's about nine million feet high, and he rides us about a thousand feet into the ground. And we're like one of them cartoon horses out there just spread out. And oh my God, you broke me. That's exactly what God does. He breaks us. People say, I, I used to hear independent Baptists say, now don't pray that God will humble you because he just might do that. Amen. Have anybody ever heard one of them stupid knuckleheads say that? You must have heard them say that. I've heard them say that. Now don't pray to humble me, God. Well, that's not something you pray. That's a command of God. That's an imperative command. Humble yourself under the hand of God. And that means to cut, cut us down, level us on our faces. That is, so, that is so ignorant. Let me read the end of this paragraph and we'll come back next week. Calvinism held the same message which saves men, makes them holy, and that faith, which is not bound up with holiness, is not saving faith at all. If there ain't no holiness there, it's not faith, and you're going to hell being a member of the big Baptist church. Do I believe Baptists are going to hell? Going to hell by the thousands. It was, it was because he knew this that Spurgeon took no part in holiness conventions. I don't like them either. But had he been called upon to address worldly believers who needed to be sanctified, there is no question what he would have had to say, those people who have faith 
which allows them to think lightly of past sin, have the faith of devils. Whew, let me read that again. Who? Those people who have a faith which allows them to look lightly of past sins have the faith of devils and not the faith of God's elect. If you're not ashamed of your past sins, and the Bible says <coughs> that we have to repent. And repent, Jeremiah 31, 18 and 19 gives us the best, the best definition of repentance. Repentance, Jeremiah said, Lord, if you turn me, I will be turned. The word repent does not mean to turn yourself and then believe God. It means to be turned and then to see. Then to recognize, Jeremiah 31, 18 and 19. And then Jeremiah said, three things will happen. You'll be ashamed, first of all, for the way you've lived. I am so ashamed of the way I've lived. And I've heard people say, well, I'm not ashamed of anything I've ever done. Have you ever heard that said? Yes, sir. Let me tell you, if you're not ashamed of sin in your past and you look lightly upon it, there's no holiness there, there's no godliness there. And let me tell you what, when I've been out in the middle of sin, I wasn't ashamed while I was doing it. But God lets you really feel embarrassed after it's all over with, somewhere way down the road after he deals with you. Such who think sin a trifle and have never sorrowed on account of it may know that their faith is not genuine. Boy, that's scary right there. That ain't doubt right there. That's worse than doubt. If you, let me read that again. Such who think sin a trifle. It's just something small, a light thing. And have never sorrowed on account of it, may know that their faith is not genuine. You think I say hard things? This man says, if you don't think, if you think, if you think of your past sins as just trifling, it's just no big deal. If you always think that way the rest of your life, you don't belong to God. You have to be ashamed for sin. I'll tell you what, I like this man. Such men have, as have a faith which allows him to live carelessly in the present who say, well, I am saved by simple faith. <laughs> it's good. I like it. I'm saved by simple faith. I've heard that before. And enjoy the carnal pleasures and lusts of the flesh. Such men are liars. That's not Jim Brown. That's Charles Spurgeon saying that. You see, they used to say these hard things. They have not the faith which will save the soul. Oh, if any of you have such a faith as this, I pray God to turn it out bag and baggage. Get it out of your life. I'm going to come back next week right there. Boy, I'll tell you, I like this guy. Don't y'all like him? Whew, that is a strong book, The Forgotten Spurgeon. Yeah, we need to order a bunch of those, and, and everybody needs to get there. We're talking about regeneration. When God regenerates us, he puts us into his family, and then we can't live just any old way. We've been talking about some of the, uh, some of the complaints about predestination. And one of the major complaints I've heard since I was very young, let me read something here to you. David pulled this out of reprobation asserted. John Bunyan, I, I got the, uh, the new books in on, uh, by John Bunyan, Grace Abounding. He talks about all of his doubts. I've got about 10 of them coming in. If y'all like to have one of them, be sure and let me know. And then I've got the uh, other books coming in by Tom Watson. Uh, doctrine of Repentance. Boy, if you read those two books, it'll make you weep and you'll feel like such a fool, just like they felt and like I feel. Let me read this to you. Psalms 139, 16. It's from John Bunyan's Reprobation Asserted. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Now as touching the elect, they are by this decree confined to that limited number of persons that must amount to the complete making up the fullness of the mystical body of Christ. That's God's family. Yea, so confined by this eternal purpose that nothing can be diminished from or added thereto, and hence it is that they are called his body and members in particular. The fullness of him that filleth all in all, Ephesians 4 and 13, which body, considering him as the head thereof, in conclusion maketh up one perfect man and holy temple for the Lord. These are called Christ's substance, inheritance, and lot, Psalm 16, and are said to be booked, marked, and sealed with God's most excellent knowledge, approbation, and liking. 
2 Timothy 2, 19, As Christ said to his father, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. That's what we're talking about. God has to perfect us by holiness by the fire. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them, Psalms 139, 16. This being thus, I say, it is in the first place impossible that any of those members should miscarry. Ain't going to be no miscarriages with God. For who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect, Romans 8, 33, and because they are as to number every way sufficient, being his body, and so by their completing to be made a perfect man, therefore all others are rejected. People don't like that, that God intentionally made men to reject them. But he said he does it so he could show his wrath and make his power known. He can't do that on vessels of mercy. You have to have bad to have good. If it's all good, then there's no bad. If there's no up, there's no, if there's no down, there's no up. Is there? No. You have to have hell to have heaven. That the purpose of God according to election might stand, Romans 9, 11. Besides, it would not only argue weakness in the decree, but monstrousness in the body, if after this any appointed should miscarry. Well, if you'll only let God, you won't be miscarried, and, and God will bring you to full birth. No, of his will beget he us by, by the word of his spirit that we might be a kind of first fruits, or any besides them be added to them. You can't add or take away from the word of God. And what Mr. Bunyan's talking about is the same thing that Charles Spurgeon's talking about. We're, God don't miscarry us, and we're birthed into his kingdom as little children of birth. One more time. Go, to, go over there to Matthew 18. Let's look at this. The big complaint from most of the Armenians and most of the free will people they don't like it because they say, well, you believe that it's all done before the foundation of the world. Yes, and that God's got a certain number. Yes, that's called the body of Christ. He hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy. We're bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. And believe of the truth. He's going to separate us all of our lives from sin. Now, let's read over here in Matthew, the 18th chapter. He births us. By regeneration, we come in. And one of the complaints is that people will say, y'all believe God ordained certain men to heaven, certain ones to hell. That's right. But it's not fatalistically. He births us into his family and his law in his family. And when you have a family... The father is supposed to be the head of the family. He's supposed to execute a righteous law to that family. That's what God the Father does. And you can't live in his family any way you want to. You have to live in his family according to his laws. And now we see the families of this world, and we see someone in really bad fixes. You can't live in God's family that way. Now, let's read here Matthew 18. Here is how we're birthed into the family. Here's how we come into the family. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus. Matthew 18 and 1. Came the disciples unto Jesus saying, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child unto him and set, and set him in the midst of them. And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted. And that word converted is strepho. S-T-R-E-P-H-O. P-H-O. And that means to be reverted and turned around or to reverse or twist and cause to go in another direction. Corrected. Our direction has to be changed and we won't change our own direction because we don't have any ability to. Unless, at verily I say unto you, except you be converted, turned around, and become as little children. Now people will say, oh, well, you believe that certain children are born to go to heaven and certain children are born uh, to go to hell. That's right. But any of them that die before they come to a knowledge of good and evil by necessity, by mathematical necessity of the scriptures. When I say mathematical necessity, by mathematical deduction, I am talking about deducing from the word of God what the Bible says. 
How does a man go to hell? The wages of sin is death, not the wages of a sin nature. This has been argued for the last 2,000 years. Do babies go to hell? Certainly not. They have no sin. They are innocent, the Bible says. And we have to be converted and become as little children. If you don't, you shall not enter into the kingdom, the family of God. Families of kingdom are the walk or the basis. You'll not enter into the family of God unless you become. You remember I said a while ago, as many as received him, to them gave you the power to come into being, to become. That word become in John 1 and 12 is the same word as this word here. It is the word G-I-N-O-M-A-I. Now, you've got a whole list of words that goes with that. You've got the word uh, G-E-N-E, G-E-N-N-E-S-I-S, G-E-N-E-A. That word gene is the word generation. You've got a whole list of words. The genes is our existence. Now, that word become means to cause to come into a state of existence or being. Now, when you are a being, it's because you've been birthed. You've been begotten, you've been conceived, and you've been birthed, and you come into being, and you are a living being, and in a man's genes, you have something called the very essence of life, or the DNA. Our DNA is our very existence. If a child is born to be a vessel of wrath, he has to grow up and come to sin. Right, he can't, he can't go to hell. That's right. God, in fact, the scripture says that God has to reserve these for darkness. He says they'll be reserved for darkness. Remember prison? Prison means, the word prison is the division of light and darkness, and we've been predetermined for the light. And 2 Peter, the second chapter, and the book of Jude tells us that these men are reserved for everlasting darkness. God has to get them to darkness and leave them there and not call them out of darkness. Now, God cannot contradict himself when he says the wages of sin, that word sin, and all have sinned, and all have sinned, is a, the context of that is between Gentile and Jew. It's not between babies and adults. But the wages of sin, babies can't sin. They don't know good from evil. They are innocent. And since they're innocent, they don't know good for evil. Therefore, they can't sin, and God can't contradict his own word when he says the wages of sin is death. So therefore, any babies that die before they come to an accountable age, they were, they were made upright in their mother's womb. That's what the scripture says. Those of us who are vessels of mercy, we were made upright in the womb. We were covered in the womb. Then we died spiritually when we came to good and evil and did all the time we were in good and evil, uh, Paul says he reserved us until he takes us to faith. And he protects us, all of his children, all lost sheep belong to the shepherd. Goats belong to the devil. This is not, we are not talking about a biological miracle changing goats to sheep. We are his sheep from the foundation of the world when you're conceived in your mother's womb, when you come out of the womb, when you come to a knowledge of good and evil, if you are elect of God, <coughs> he protects you all the time you're in your sin. I don't care what kind of sin. If you murder 50 people and you get out here and get drunk constantly and you end up uh, having the longest, most hardest, difficult ordeals in life and then he brings you to faith, God protected you through that whole thing. And it don't matter what men believe. That's what the Bible teaches. He said, except you be converted and come into being as little children. You shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have to come into being or be caused to be. That's what that word become is. Get on my. Same word, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become. We have to become as little children. He wouldn't say that if little children are not birthed into the kingdom or caused to be. Look over here at Luke 18. Mary wanted me to read this Sunday, but I had planned to read it tonight. There's something I want to show you here that's very interesting. Look here in Luke 18. Babies, do, when they die, do not go to hell. They're innocent. I'm going to stay on this because I want us to see this. Mike, uh, Mike Leiter, who lives with me and Mary, uh, he said, I was raised in a primitive Baptist home, 
And I heard all my life that babies who die go to hell. But he said, I never, ever heard anybody uh, exhaust this doctrine. We're going to keep preaching it, and we're going to preach it. And it's something that the world needs to hear that all predestinationists do not believe that. Because men don't understand this. Now look here in Luke 18 and verse 15. And they brought unto him also infants that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such for of such is the kingdom of God. Of this kind is what that means. Of this type, of this nature is the family. When you say kingdom of God, think family. This is what God's family is. And look at verse 17 I want to show you. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, shall in no wise enter therein. Now, see that word receive. Guess what that word is. It's the word D-E-C-H-O-M-A-I. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That means to accept and offer Given. You say, does that mean I have to accept Christ? No. Does not mean that. That, mean, that means you cannot accept Christ as a grown-up man, as a sinner. Go to 1 Corinthians one more time. Except you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child. You can't receive it like a grown-up man because 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, says you can't. If you're a grown man and in full, uh, and you have full capabilities of all your faculties and all your senses, the scripture says you cannot accept the kingdom of God as a physical man. Now what this is going to say, this is going to show us that little children are not carnal. That they're not, they don't exercise the senses like grown people do. Look here in verse 14, chapter 2, 1 Corinthians. For the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Now, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is truth. That's when the Holy Spirit comes and lives in our hearts, writes the Word of God on our hearts, and that is the law of the kingdom that we have to live by. We don't want to. It's, a, not a, it's totally in opposition to our nature. And that word natural is the word sukikos, P-S-U-C-H-I, P-S-U, C-H-I-K-O-S. Now, we get our word physical from that and the word sensual. Sensual. Now, the word sensual means the man of the senses. When something is sensuous, it makes you think and feel and see and hear emotionally, doesn't it? Certain music that you hear, if I listen to, if I, if I hear the... Uh, Skyliner singing, since I don't have you, I'm going, oh me, 19 years old and a 51 Ford, and oh me. And I get real blue. And if I smell certain perfumes, I, if I smell high karate, I think of 1963. <laughs> or Jade East. I think, oh man, deliver us from that. Oh, get out of here. And it, in the senses, and that's what men do of this world when idolatry means it's the word idolatria, ido meaning to see, and latria means to serve what you see. That's the senses. You look at something, you desire it. That's the physical sensual man. Now the scripture says the natural man receiveth not, does not accept. You know what he's saying? Unless you receive the kingdom of God as a little child, little children are not sensual. That's what he's saying. Before they come to a knowledge of good and evil, they, they are believers if they are the elect of God. And what he's saying, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to him. That's not the way it is with a little child. Luke 18 tells us, 
we have to receive or accept, but the natural man can't. The man that's the sinful sinner. Look over here in James. I haven't ever shown you this, but... Huh? Okay, three and one. Okay, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, because spiritual is opposition to the carnal or the physical man or the man of the senses. I can't speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. <coughs> for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet are ye now able, for ye are yet carnal. And that word carnal is sarkikos, and it means, it comes from the word sarx, which means flesh. You're fleshly. You want the flesh and to fulfill the flesh. That's the sensual man, the man of the senses. Babies are not sensual. They're not physical. Look over here in James. Go to James, right after the book of Hebrews. Go to the book of James, the third chapter, and look at this. Here's that word sukikos that does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. It does not accept an offer that is given. It cannot accept spiritual things. And babies are not that way. Now look here. Look here in verse chapter 3, verse 14. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, sukikos, devilish. The word devilish is the word daemon, daemonides. It actually comes from the word daemon, and it means, and of course the word daemon means distribute fortunes. The sensual man wants the fleshly things. What he is saying here. He's verifying that that verse in Luke 18, that babies are not sensual, they don't desire the things of the flesh, and they haven't gone after sin. The natural man cannot receive. The man of the senses who's carnal, like the Corinthians were, and they're living in their sin, cannot accept Christ. But babies receive Christ, those elect ones, because they're of God. Now, we're talking about babies. And now, uh, we've, had, we've had the complaints that along the way in life, and I've believed for years and years, I have believed this is a terrible and awful doctrine that puts babies in hell when they've never sinned. Now, I want you to go back over here. I want you to go back over here to, to uh, Romans, the fifth chapter. And I want us to look at something here, because we're born, we're born again, uh, you know what uh, Rusty Gray told me Sunday? He said, you know, and y'all heard, most, most of you heard him say it. He said, here's what really gets me. He said, I kept hearing all my life about the new birth and being born again, but I never did hear anybody tell me I had to die and give up the flesh. I had to take a cross daily and die daily. That's what new birth is. New birth is resurrection, and resurrection means life after death a new life after dying. And something that's dead was once alive. That's what we're talking about. Those of us who are the elect of God, we were born in our mother's womb. Jeremiah said, before I said, God said to him, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. The word formed, Yatsar, means to narrow. He put Jeremiah in the narrow way. And when, he, when the scripture tells us over there in Proverbs, that we are to train up a child in the way that they should go. And the word tra train is the word C-H-A-N-O-W-K, Kanak. And that word comes from the word Enoch, E-N-O-C-H. And it means narrow. We need to narrow our children. So when they come to the knowledge of good and evil, we'll put them in the narrow way. The narrow way. Now, they were originally in the narrow way when they were babies. And they were covered in the womb. God has those who are vessels of wrath. He takes them to darkness and never redeems them because he reserves them to everlasting darkness. I want us to understand, I'm going to exhaust this thing as much as I, you won't ever exhaust the word of God. We're never going to exhaust that. 
Now, here's, here's one of the complaints, and this has gone on for centuries, that babies have to go to hell if they can't get in the way and they can't be narrowed and go through the fiery trial. God is not going to hold someone responsible that has no sin. Now look here. I'm going to show you something here. Look here in Romans, the fifth chapter. I want us to look at this. Let me see if I can find my, my pages on. Yeah, here it is. All right. Look here in Romans 5 and 13. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. What's what we're going to talk about? <laughs> we're going to talk about imputation. We're going to talk about imputation for sin, okay? Now, babies do not have law in their life. The scripture tells us, that's what Paul says. Let's look over there and let's see that. We're going to talk about imputation. Because imputation is very important. Now, look over here in 7. Now, remember that. Sin is not imputed. Imputed. Let me write that down. Sin is not imputed where, there, where no law. Now, here's what Paul says. Now, what, now look over here. Look over here. Now, look over here in Romans 7, and he says right here, look at verse 6, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin. Paul said... Here is how I learned what sin was. Now, God will not impute sin where there's no law. He said, I learned sin by the law. The law taught me, but I had to be old enough to understand what it was. That's what he says right here. He says, but by the law, for I had not known lust. He takes out one of them. One of these laws of God, thou shalt not covet, he said, I had not known lust except the law had said. Now, do you think he's talking about when he was a baby, the, somebody could stand over his, his uh, cradle and say, that's why I'm not covered, Paul. And he's going, good, 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 spitting up on himself. No, that's not, he's not talking about then. He's talking about just as Adam came to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when Adam was innocent, as soon as Adam comes to the tree, as soon as every human being comes to the tree, or to, to all that is in the world, that's what we know the tree is, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh. She saw a tree good for food, the lust of the eyes. She saw a tree that was pleasant to the eyes, the pride of life. She saw a tree to make her wise. She saw all that's in the world, that's lust. And that's why Paul used this, because all that's in the world, when you get into every sin, it's all covetousness. All of it. God says, thou shalt not, and you say, yes, I will, I want to. I will kill him. I will have her. I will steal that. And it's all pride. If you notice that sin is all the same thing, don't matter what it is, sin is pride. Pride is self. Self says, I will, I want. My way. That's what sin is. And Paul said, until I read in the law, thou shalt not govern, I heard it with an understanding mind, I didn't know what it was. And you have to know the law to break it because sin, 1 John 3 and 4 says, sin is the transgression of the law. That word transgression is the word anomia. Nomos is the word law. A-N-O-M-I-A is the word iniquity. And it's also that word transgression. The word law is nomos. And you have to be able to transgress God's law, anomos, place the alpha, it means unlawful. The alpha negates the word and gives you an opposite meaning. Law means legal food. And enomos, transgress, means to go out there and eat of what's unlawful, what God says, don't do that. And you have to be able to rebel against God and do it in order to have sin imputed to your life. 
and he will not impute sin where there's no law. Now let's look at the word impute, okay? Besides that, Jeremiah 19 says that Israel offered their innocence on their altars. And that word innocent, naki, means, it means free. They're free. They're not in prison. Babies are not in prison. Now, look at, let's look at imputation, okay? This word imputed over there, this is used twice in the Bible. That word imputation. It's used over in the book of Philemon. When Paul, you remember, he talks about Onesimus, a runaway slave. And he says, if he has charged anything over there, charge it to my account. It means to lay to the account. Lay to an account. It means God will not charge you with sin if you do not know what the law is. See, but you say, but Jim, grown men, you mean, what if we don't have God's Bible? Well, now, over there in the second chapter of Romans, he said those... Well, look over at the second chapter. Look at the second chapter. Look at verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, and they really actually have the law in their hearts. What he is saying, and I said this many times before, I read an article one time by um, one of these guys who studies all the tribes, different tribes of the world, and he said, every tribe in the world, everywhere they've ever been able to find, no matter how distant they were, whether they were the headhunters of Borneo, whether they were the, whether they were the cannibals of, uh, of South America, or where, whether they were some lost uh, Zulu tribe in South Africa or a pygmy tribe or no matter where you went in the world or there was some Tibetan race that was way off far in Mongolia, way off in, this, in, the, uh, in the mountains there, no matter who they were, every tribe they've ever been able to find says it's wrong to kill another man and it's wrong for without, without cause and it's wrong to take another man's wife. So they know thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not commit adultery. They know that. We're not talking about grown men. We're talking about God will not impute sin where there's no law. But before the law came, was there a law there? Well, certainly there was. God's law was still there because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And by faith, Noah being one of God of things not seen as yet, it had never rained before. He moved with fear when God said it. That was his law. Didn't he give Adam a law in the garden? Thou shalt not eat over there. You eat here. This is the legal food over here. That's what the meaning of the word law is in the Greek. Eat here. People say there was no law. Yes, there was. It, it's written on the hearts of every mature man who knows right from wrong and good from evil. You can take the wildest uh, aborigines, go way out there a thousand miles into bush in Australia, and they know that it's wrong to take another man's wife. They know it's wrong to kill a man or murder a man with no cause. They all know that. So therefore, they're a law unto themselves and they have God's law written by nature on their hearts. That's what they have. So when people say, <coughs> when people try to make that, uh, that, they try to come up and say, well, babies want, to, they want their milk. The Bible says God doesn't impute it where there's no sin. And Paul said, I had to know I had to come to a place, and back in Romans 7, one more time. And then he says, the only way, here's what the law did to me. When I found out thou shalt not covet, it killed me because I wasn't able to do right. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me. That word wrought, by the way, you know what that word is? Cather Gadzimites, the same word as perform. Up there in verse 18, when Paul said, for to will is present with me, and how to perform that which is good. I find out the word kater gadzomai means to fully accomplish. He said, I don't know how to do good. Kater gadzomai. I need to write that. K-A-T-E-R-G-A-Z-O-M-A-I. It's the same word over there in Philippians 2 and 12 that says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's the word work out, work out. And by the way, that's an imperative command. And Paul said, I don't know how to work out. I don't know how to perform good. What is it Paul knew how to do? Wrought. Work out your own 
salvation. That's an imperative mood in the Greek, and that's a command. And Paul says, I don't know how. And verse 13 of Philippians 2 says, It is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And if he don't work in you and you're not his son, you won't never accomplish righteousness. And when Paul said, and here's what Paul was able to do, sin, when he found out what the law was. Here's what he says. But sin taking occasion by the commandment, ketergadzomai, fully accomplished in me all manner of concupiscence. That's what it did, and that's the word lust, epithumia. For without the law, sin was dead. If I didn't have the law when I was a baby, there was no sin. God doesn't impute sin where there's no law. And I'll get to imputation in a minute. For I was alive without the law once. That was when I was a baby. But when the commandment came, sin revived. I died spiritually. And I was dead in trespasses and sin. God protected me as his elect. He brought me to faith. And when faith came, then life came into my life. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment, sin taking occasion by the commandment of God. Thou shalt not covet, and I did, and it wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, epithemia, lust, same word, deceived me, and by it slew me. Sin killed me. I was alive as a child, and God won't impute sin where there's no law. Look here at this word imputation. The word impute is the word E-L-L-E-E-L-L-O, E-L-L-O-G-E-O, elogeo. It means to attribute to something or to account as something. Now, it's like, here's what imputation is. Andy had to take the bar exam to become an attorney. And he, but he went to school and he learned all this law, a man's law. And then after he graduated and and, uh, and after he took the bar exam, which I understand is very difficult, then he became a lawyer. <laughs> I just thought it's said. <laughs> he became a lawyer. Now, if by the grace of the people who run the state, if I could go up there and they'd say, now what we're going to do, we're not going to make you go to school. If you can pass this bar exam, and you know this law, and we're going to put together this test. You don't have to go to school. We're going to impute to you all the education and all the credibility of being an attorney, and we're going to give you a law degree. Now, that's what an imputation means to, to put to someone's account, to attribute. Let me read you something here about this. Let me read this about imputation. Let me see if I can find it. Imputation. Yeah. Here it is. This is out of Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Here's the word elogeo. From in and loga. Of course, we know the word logos means word. And God imputes by his word sin where the law is. It means to lay to account and is thus so-called hypostasis. It is a technical term for to charge with. God said, I will not charge you with sin if you don't understand and know the law. But even if you're a heathen, you will do by nature things contained in the law if you're a grown man and you're of the senses, good senses. But if you're a baby, I will not impute sin there because there's no law as far as you're concerned because you don't even understand and know what it is. <coughs> Let me read a little more here. In the New Testament, it occurs twice. It is used in the commercial sense in Philemon 18. Any law suffered through the runaway of Onesimus is to be charged to Paul. It means to lay to somebody's account. God is not going to charge you with sin if there's no law there, if you're a baby. And you're innocent, as the Bible teaches. Uh, in uh, Revelation 5 and 13... This elogisthai of man's sin, that's a variation of the word, of man's sin by God is to be regarded as given with the revelation of the law in your heart. Adam was confronted by God's law. 
He said, Thou shalt not. And from the days of Moses, men have the divine law. Thus in Adam and from the days of Moses, sin arises in relation to the divine command. They did know the law, but they didn't have the law from Mount Sinai, but they knew right from wrong. In fact, someone had to tell Cain, I had to tell Abel to offer a blood sacrifice. I'm sure Adam said, son, come here, let me tell you, God has told me. Now, there's a lot of things in the Bible, and we need to realize something. You couldn't offer a sacrifice without being a priest of God. God never changes. Abel is the first priest. He is the first high priest in the Bible. No one could offer blood sacrifice without being a priest. He was the first priest of God. Just because it don't say that doesn't mean he wasn't because God never changes. And God had to give, he didn't kind of wonder and say, hmm, let me see, I wonder. He wasn't just kind of figure out God. Adam told him, son, offer a blood sacrifice, and he had to tell Cain the same thing. Cain said, I'll offer him the works of my hands. This is what I did. And that's not what God wants. Thus in Adam and from the days of Moses, sin arises in relation to the divine command and is, and is revolt against God's will. The law, however, places under the curse of death those who break it in Galatians 3.10. Let's look at that, Galatians 3.10. Galatians 3.10. You have to break the law. Babies can't break the law. We need to really understand this. This is very important. This has been a point argued for the last 2,000 years. Galatians 3. Let's read this. 3. Let's read here, verse 10. Let's, let's back up to verse 6 because there is a synonym for this word, elegeo. There's a synonym. There's a synonym with the word logizomai, L-O-G-I-Z-O-M-A-I. Now, synonym means a word that is the same. This word logizomai has the same basic meaning. It means to conclude or to account something or reckon. It means I'm going to consider, uh, let me see, how can I put this? If you can, like I've said, uh, if you can do this thing over here, we will put to your account, we will consider you, I say I used this term before, I said it's like the water boy or the guy who takes care of the equipment on a football team is not a part of the football team. But most of the football teams, they, they, if, he will, if he'll carry their bags and, and he'll bring the water to them and do all the things they need, they will account him as a part of the football team. And in high schools, a lot of times those guys get letters and the girls don't know that he didn't get out there and butt heads with everybody. They account him. They put to his account that he's a member of the team. They account him for that, for doing the certain other things, even though he never played the game. That would be called imputation. It would be considered, it's like, uh, it's kind of like cars. You can attribute that a big Mercury is a town car because it's got the same chassis, doesn't it? <laughs> you just pay a ton more for that town car because they put a different body on it. But inside, it's the same thing. And so they, you can attribute that. Or let's put it this way. You take that body off, that mercury, and put a town car body, and you can attribute the whole thing as being a town car, including the guts. You see what I'm saying? It means to put to account or to consider or to regard something as being. Being. Do you see what I said? Being. That's what impute means. Now look here. Let's read this here in verse 6. Now here is that other word that this little word legizomai means to take inventory or estimate. Here's probably one of the best words for the word legizomai. Seal in. Seal you did. Conclude. You, here's the conclusion of the matter. Here's what we're going to conclude about this situation here. I'm not going to conclude or consider that you're a sinner unless you break the law. You have to know what it is, first of all. Now, look here. He says here in verse 6, Even as Abraham believed God, <coughs> and it was accounted. You see that word accounted? That's a synonym for this, for this word. 
Elogeo. It's a synonym. It has the same basic meaning. It means to suppose or to put something upon. It means we're going to conclude or consider this. What we're going to do, the faith that Abraham had, the word believed is the same word as faith. It's just the verb. Faith is the noun. Faith comes by hearing. Hear and obey are the same words. And when God said, Abraham, take thy son, thine only Isaac. That's the only one I recognize. And take him to, to the mountain yonder. Take him to Mount Moriah and offer him upon an altar. God said, what I will do when you do that, you believe me, I told you that I would bless the, your, I bless all the earth with your son. That your son Isaac will be the blessing of all the earth. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to conclude righteousness in you if you do that. I'm not going to consider the sin of your life. I'm going to consider you righteous. I'm going to lay to your account righteousness. That's what the word impute means. To lay to somebody's account. He's not going to impute sin where there's no law. And there's none in a baby. Because he, you have to, what he's saying, you have to understand it and you have to break it. According to Galatians 3.10, we'll read down to it. Even as Abraham believed God and it was laid to his account. That what he did when, he, when God told him to kill his son, that he would have a baby... And to do the things that he did, he did not consider the unrighteousness in his life. He did not not consider the parts that he broke. He said, I'm going to conclude your obedience and believing me as righteousness. That's what imputation means. To him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith are the same are the children of Abraham. Are, are you and I of faith? Yes. In faith is death to self. Faith comes by hearing or by obedience. In faith is the substance. That's, that's daily dying. So those that die daily, we're Abraham's children. We're spiritual Jews, aren't we? Well, certainly we are. I don't even understand people saying that the church isn't spiritual Jews when we're children of Abraham. Those who are of faith are children of Abraham. Through Isaac and Isaac shall thy seed be called. We're not called through Jacob. We're called in Isaac because Isaac was raised from the dead. And that's what God's people will be. They'll be resurrected from the dead daily because they'll die daily. And the scripture foreseeing. Now, one night I was watching uh, that lame brain in California, Fred Price. And he said, now, Abraham, uh, Abraham uh, couldn't have been saved because uh, the gospel is, is the resurrection. And Abraham was never taught the resurrection. What? Abraham was raised from the dead, the dead loins of his father, the dead womb of his mother. And that's what verse 8 is talking about. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, the Gentiles, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Now, evidently, Benny Hinn's not paying attention. Uh, Benny, Hinn. Well, Benny Hinn's not paying attention either. Fred Price ain't paying attention to what he's reading, is he? And he says, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. You have to be committing transgression. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. You have to break the law for sin to be imputed. Let me read the rest of this. In the days between Adam and Moses, the race had no law. When men sinned, they just did so. But they had the law written on their hearts. They knew right from wrong. In terms of the total situation created by the fall of Adam and not in conscious enmity against God or rebellion against a given law other than the law, and I'll add to this, other than the law of nature that knows what right and wrong is, the death which they died was thus a comprehensive destiny posited in Abraham, not a punishment. To be sure, God punished sin in this period, and he did it according to his law, but he doesn't impute. Let me, let me give you something else here. Let me give you something else here. If God's going to impute sin, let me show you something. Let me show you something. People say, God compares his people as little children. Did you know that? And some people, I've heard, I've read, 
I've read on this years past, and I've never commented on this. In fact, I brought it up a few weeks ago, and I was going to have Glenn, I was going to have Glenn put this down, but I'm just now getting around to it. Look here in, go back to John 13 and 33. Now, I want you to notice what God calls his people. Here's how he addresses his people. I, I'm going I'm to give you several of these together. Look here at John 13 and 33. 13 and 33. Now, he, this is the last Passover. This is the last supper from, from, from chapter thir 13 all the way to the end of this book, all the way up to the 25th verse of that 21st chapter. This is the last, this is Thursday night. Chapter 13 is Thursday night before Jesus dies on Friday. And all the way to the end of the book is just from Friday night till Sunday morning till he meets with the apostles on Sunday. Now, this is just a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. This is a four-day period from here to the end. Now, chapter 13, this is the last supper or the last Passover, and he's talking to his apostles. And I want you to read here with me. Read here in verse, let's start here in verse 32. Uh, verse 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, if you notice what he said, he's talking to, and little children was a term of endearment. He called his family, and he called these apostles little children. Now, the reason he's doing that, that word little, ch little children, the word little means infants. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you, he said, you're my little children, you're my babies. And that's why he compares us with the little children, because the little children are innocent. Look over here in Galatians 4, go back to Galatians 4 and verse 19. This is very important because he compares us with children. 419. Verse 19, 419. My little children, you notice what Paul is saying. He's comparing us with infants. Now, why would he say that if infants are not righteous? He wouldn't. Unless we come as a little child, unless we become as a little child, we'll not enter in. And unless we are, we receive God as little children, my little children of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. What he's talking about is the forming of the fetus. He says, I want Christ to come to full growth in you. And that word formed is the word morpho. It comes from the word morphe. M-O-R-P-H-O-O. -O. And of course, we know what the word morphe may, it means to be shaped. You know, R-P-H-E? The word, we are predestined to conform or sum morphos. It comes from sum in fellowship with, where to be shaped in fellowship with Christ. That's what he's talking about here. We're to come to full fruition through being formed. Now look over here, look over here. I want to show you these because this is important. Go to 1 John. 1 John says this several times. 1 John, 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 had, John is, I guess, the apostle of agape because he uses that term continually all through this book. And look here, 1 John. Let's read this several times. 1 John 2 and 1. What does he say? My little children. He's referring to the church as little children. The whole point is this. Little children are innocent. They cannot have sin imputed to them. I've got a whole list of, if y'all want this, I'll just give you this, but every time that word logizomai, Romans 2 and 21, it shall be accounted, uh, 4 and 3 was accounted, 4 and 4 reckoned, 4 and 5 counted, 4 and 6 imputed, 4 and 8 will impute, 4 and 9 was reckoned, 4 and 10 was reckoned, 4 and 11 imputed, 4 and 22 imputed, 23 imputed, 24 imputed, uh, 6 and 11, reckon yourselves also dead to sin, impute to yourself that you're dead to sin, over here in 818, reckon, 
I reckon that the, that the sufferings of this present world are not to be compared to the glory that we'll see one day. I reckon, I impute, I impute that this suffering is nothing. That's what he's saying. So when we're, so when we're talking about imputation, we're talking about placing something upon something because of a certain thing that's done or a situation. And God says, I don't impute sin where there is no law. And children don't have any law. If y'all want this, all these words, let so account, think of, thought, think, imputing, think, suppose, was accounted, charge, all these words, suppose. All those words are the words impute, and it means to reckon something to be so. So God says, I will not impute sin to babies. You have to break the law. We don't believe in original sin. I'm not talking about Adam. It wasn't the original person that sinned. I'm talking about original sin. There's a light guiding me. <laughs> I believe in that Adam was the original man that sinned, but the scripture tells us that the children will not suffer for the sins of the father. God does not impute. He does not impute punishment to children for what their fathers do. When we're talking about imputation, we're talking, and the whole purpose of him calling us little children. Look over there in 2 and 12. Look at 2 and 12. Notice this. And John, John is the beloved apostle. I heard a preacher say years and years ago, I believe it was Dr. Roy Kemp, and he said, he said, John never spoke of himself in the first person. He always spoke of himself in the third person, that one whom the Lord loved. And he always, he never said, God loved me. He'd say, the one that loved me or the one that loved us, or the one that loved that apostle. And that's what he says. He, he, John is the one that said, he doesn't say we love God. He said here in his love, not that we love God. He said, for God so loved us. That's what he said. And so John is always talking about God's love toward us. And wh that's why he's using the word little children. Look here in verse, look here in verse 18. Or verse 12. In verse 12, he uses the same term. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake, for his authority's sake. And look here in verse, verse 13. Verse 13, he says, I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I run unto you, young, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. And look down here in verse 18. Little children, why do you think he's using this term over and over again? Don't you think? It's because little children are innocents. And he says, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard the, that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. And then look down here in verse 28, verse 28, and now little children abide in him. May know, or mone. Uh, may know is abide, continue in him or in his sufferings that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And he's saying, little children, go through the fire so you become mature. That's what he's saying. This word imputation is a very important word. It means to lay to the account. God's not going to lay to the account to those who do not know sin. But let me tell you one thing, adult. Let me tell you one thing, free will person. When you say, I walked the aisle and got saved one night, and it's just like Mr. Spurgeon said, that's the faith of devils if it has no, no holiness, no continual sanctification. Let me tell you what he will do. When you know right from wrong, he'll impute to you sin. If, you're not if he doesn't bring to you a place of being ashamed of it, you don't know him. And he says the same thing over here in 3 and 7. Why does John say this so much? Look at 3 and 7. 3 and 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. You remember the word patha? You remember that? He said, how long, little children, will you love simplicity? And the word patha is an Old Testament word. And it means to have an open mind. He said, little children, don't stay little children. Don't just keep your mind wide open. It means to have big wide doors to your mind and accept everything. He says, little children, abide. Go through the fire so you can become grown-up, mature adults. You notice little children is different from 
mature. Or should I say, M-A-R-T-Y-R, little children can't witness. The word witness is the word martus, and it means to be able to die. What he's redressing here is brand new born babies. And we're not talking about physically born babies. We're talking about babies in the Word. Don't stay babies, he's saying. Come to a place to be able to die, and that takes maturity, and maturity comes by the fire. You'll only become mature when you stay in the fire. And then, and then he says this a couple more times. Look here. Look over here in 3 and 18. He says, well, he says, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Don't let somebody tell you that righteousness, don't let the free willer, the Armenian, say righteousness is something that God does in us, and we have no idea what it is. Yes, you do. The word righteousness is the word dikaiosune. It means to render innocent. And God has rendered little children innocent. When he said Israel offered their innocence, the blood of innocence on their altars, that word, it means righteous. It means free. Now look here, look here in, look at 3 and 18, 3 and 18. I want you to see this. John continually addresses the church as little children. If little babies were going to hell, if they died, he certainly wouldn't use this terminology so freely. He says, little children... Let us not love in word. Don't just simply be a little baby child and say, I love Jesus. And that's why we start off as newborn babes in the Lord. And he said, we, uh, he said, he, hey, I fed you with milk of the word and you need to go to meat, but most of you need to go back to the bottle. And he, that's what he told the Philippians, uh, the Corinthians. He said, you are not able to endure the meat. I have to keep feeding you with milk. Neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And then he says in, five, in four and four, Four and four, ye are of God, little children. We are of God, four and four, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that's in you than he's in the world. And the one who confesses Christ, the one who comes alive in Christ and agrees with God by what he does. And then he says here the same thing in First, first John 5 and 21. 5 and 21. 5 and 21. I've got so many other things to say on this. I don't know if I've... Yeah, 5 and 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from covetousness, from self. I, where am I on this? Do I have any time? Huh? No, me. I don't have much time, do I? Goodness, I was going to go into the way tonight. Let me read you something here on this word, logizomai. Out of, if you can get these, this is uh, Kittles. Theological Dictionary of the two New Testament, and this is a dic these are Dictionary of New Testament words. It's word histories. It gives you how the word was originally used in the Old Testament, how the origin of the word where it came from. It'll give you that uh, when when you hear me talking about love is the relationship of a king to his subjects. I got that out of Mr. Kittles. Kittles is a fantastic book, and you can look it up. It's got a, an index book. You can look the word up by looking up the word in the English. If you can read the, uh, if you can read the Greek, you can look it up in the Greek. But it'll give you the exact meaning. Listen to this. Here is this word, impute. I want you to understand what impute means is lay to someone's account. I won't lay sin to account where there's no law understood about thou shalt not. Everyone that is a sinner out in the world, don't tell me they don't know what sin is. They're arrogant and proud, but they know what sin is. Every grown adult, every teenager. Every, I walked into a drugstore one day, and one guy said, and he was try, he's, all, he's a real estate broker, and he's always trying to get to me. And he said, and there was about 10 people sitting there, and every once in a while he'll cuss in front of me or he'll do something, and he's trying to embarrass me, but when he does, I'm going to come back on him. And he said to me, he said, do you, hey, Jim Brown, and there was about 10 people sitting there, and they were in a little coffee club, and they all sat around there drinking coffee. He said, hey, Jim Brown, do you believe a little girl eight years old go to hell? He was, he was trying, he's grinning, and he was going to try to catch me. I said, hey, Bill, do you believe an eight-year-old girl knows right from wrong? Well, yeah, I guess she does. I said, the Bible says, unto him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Yes, she'll go to hell if she don't repent. And so will you. 
Now, I'm not saying I know what age that a person comes to right and wrong. And as soon as you know right and wrong, when Adam came to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he knew evil, when a person's nature, your nature and my nature is evil, I don't know what age a person comes to when they know right and wrong. It might be, it's probably different every person. But I know this, I knew wrong when I was six and seven years old. But I also knew when I was five years old, if you'd ask me who Jesus is, I'd say, oh, Jesus is my Savior, and he died to save me from my sin, and he rose from the dead. And you know what? I really believe that. And then when I was 10 years old, my father began to preach, and every, I began to hear all these preachers say, well, you've got to accept Christ. And if you don't accept Christ, then pray the sinner's prayer. And I'm going, oh, me, oh, I want to accept Jesus because I love him. I want to be his. And I'd start walking the aisles. And when I was about 37 years old, 36 or 37, I threw out all my professions of faith because I looked back and realized I believed that who Jesus was when I was five. I had to learn to become polluted. Let me tell you, I knew who Jesus was at five. I'm not saying a five-year-old or six-year-old won't go to hell. I don't know. I don't know what age they have to come to to know right from wrong. But I'll tell you this, I knew wrong at six. Huh? Yeah, that's right. I'm not saying little kids won't go to hell. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying until they know the difference between right and wrong, until they can transgress the law, sin is the transgression of the law, and that's what sin is. And God said, I will not impute sin or the transgression of the law where there's no law understood there. He said, I won't do it. Because the wages of sin are the wages of transgression of the law is death. You have to transgress the law. And when you transgress the law, that word transgress means to eat unlawfully. You have to know that you're going beyond the boundary line. You have to know that. And it's not sins that take you beyond the boundary line. It is sin. The first one that you... I, every, you know, every one of us have a first sin. That's what killed you. That slays you spiritually and you become a dead man. That's it. And then you're dead in your sin. And God reserves you all the time you're in your sin. I don't know what, I don't know what that age is. I don't know what you have to be. I do know this. And I threw away. I had so many experiences in my life because I kept trying to get saved under Arminian preaching. I kept, I mean, everybody tell me, you got to get saved. And you don't know you're saved tonight. And Jesus comes in a minute. You're going to hell. I'm going, oh, oh, I want to go down the aisle. Oh, hurry up, start the invitation. And I kept walking the aisle and walking the aisle. And I got to where I walked the aisle and it didn't embarrass me. I just keep on walking. I kept hunting for Jesus. And let me tell you, seeking is a sign of salvation. Doubt is a sign of salvation. I said that Sunday morning. The other man's going to doubt as long as he lives because he's going to stay in charge. You say that salvation well, sure it is. <laughs> Wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, salvation is imputed. We got to get into this. I'm going to bring up imputation more because imputation is a very, very, everybody here has illustrations of imputation. If you do this, we'll consider you a member of the family. Uh, if you come over here all the time and behave yourself and, and pay your rent and, and abide by the rules of the family, we'll let you be in the family. I told a boy one time, I said, I'll, uh, he was 15 and I was going to adopt him. I said, if you'll behave the way you're supposed to behave, I said, we'll adopt you and be a part of the family and you'll get part of, this will be part of your inheritance when I die. But he didn't want to do that. He didn't want, he didn't want to do what it took to have family good <coughs> imputed to him. But it didn't mean he was literally in the family. And that's what God does. He imputes to us salvation. He imputes righteousness to us. And Abraham believed God, and faith is what imputes righteousness to us. Not, God doesn't consider how much sin we have in our life. He considers our obedience to him, and he blots out all the rest. That's what salvation is, obedience. It's obedience to the book. Boy, I, I like this. I hope y'all can understand imputation, because imputation is so important, and babies do not have sin because they don't understand it. And Paul said, I only knew sin. I only knew transgression of the law because the law said to me and said to my heart, thou shalt not covet. I said, yes, I will. Because that's what we do. That's our nature. And do y'all actually believe 
the first time you tell a little kid, and this is what the free will people think, the first time you tell a little kid, now don't you do that, if you do that I'm going to spank you, that's going to be a two year old, he's not going to do that and never do it again. Huh? And when God says, Adam, thou shalt not, does anybody actually believe that Adam wasn't going to do sin when it came to the tree? No, God said, thou shalt not, and I'm going to see to it, and it's going to take the rest of your life. You're going to fall into sin. You're going to die. This is according to my whole arrangement. Then I'm going to redeem you, and I'm going to see to it that you're obedient to me. That's what he's saying. And if you'll raise up that child, or if you will train him, narrow him in the way he should go when he's old, he'll not depart from it, if you'll put him in the narrow way. I'm going to talk about the way next week. I keep trying to get back to the way. I just felt like it was really important to understand imputation, because when we are birthed into the family of God, he does not consider all of the, uh, the evil deeds we do. He considers our faith, our believing here, our obedience to his word, and that's what he imputes to us for righteousness. That's what he does. So it don't matter. It's like Scott and Doug and Mary and Summer talking about doubting. Everybody doubts here. Everybody here doubts. And the more you doubt, the more proof you are you belong to God. It's not a matter of how bad you feel on the outside about the outer man. It's, it's the belief in God that he imputes salvation. He's going to take you to heaven anyway. Verse 228 that we read, uh, I don't remember which uh, thing was, said, said, have confidence that it's coming and be not ashamed. Yeah. Well, what you do is the, it's the part that believes that he's going to save. That outer man is the part that doubts. What, he's not going to impute salvation because you feel like you're saved. And you feel like he's going to get you when he comes back. He's going to impute salvation to the part that obeys. See, we can't separate. There's two men here. There's the inner man, Christ, and the outer man. And the only part of me that he's going to save is his seed that Christ that's in me. That's just like your seed is in that little girl of yours. That's your seed. That's your sperma. That's what baptized the egg, and that's how she was birthed, and that's part of you. The only part that he's going to save is not this outer man that's always doubting. <laughs> that's, this is not the part. You're going to get a brand new body that can't doubt. You're going to get a brand new body that can't sin. Can you imagine that? Well, won't that be good? Do y'all know what really, y'all know what messes our lives up? Sin. Because we're always grasping and say, I won't, I won't. And you know, these, if these arms were all of our desires, you know what locks us to sin? Our desires. Our wants. That's what imprisons us. Huh? Yes, that's it. And, you can't, and if you can't fulfill it, and Solomon said, I cannot fulfill. Everything is vanity and vexation of the spirit I keep bringing up to the young men. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He didn't have a bunch of uh, old ugly women and he said they are vanity and vex me there's no way you can fulfill the flesh you cannot sexually fulfill the flesh it's impossible God didn't make these tall link the slinky women for Christian people that all the men are chasing in the world that's not what he made for you he wants you to have a righteous woman that believes God <laughs> aren't they? Well, stay in this truth. And if you stay in this truth, this will draw those kind of people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth, for imputation of righteousness, because we're children of Abraham, and by faith, and you impute righteousness to us. You put it to our account, not, not considering all of this sin that we've been into. That's blotted out, and you say, the faith is all I consider. Because you're not going to save these bodies anyway. You're going to give us new ones. Lord, what a wonderful thing to think of. This old body wears me out and tires me, Lord. I'm weary and worn over it. God, help us to understand that it's our belief in you, not our unbelief, that you impute as righteousness. And there's all kinds of unbelief in every one of us. Help thou our unbelief. And Lord, we'll praise you for all things and give you glory for it. In Christ's name, amen.